Peter's talked to us before. Probably a number of you have heard Peter's um, discussions quite a bit. Let's start. We'll start with the basics, as I said, and we'll move up. So, Peter, you know, the basics really start with the three T's of good control. So, do you want to take over and start us through that process there? Yes. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Can you hear me clearly? And I guess if not, can you raise your hand to the controller of the show, the Honourable Stuart, please? Uh, so let me know and let Stuart know more particularly if you can't hear me properly. Um, it's going to be an experiment in lots of ways, as uh, Stuart's already suggested, so we'll make it work as best we can. Uh, yes, the three T's for good disease control uh, are, are listed, and I wonder if I can make this was, and work out the best strategies for managing the, the diseases themselves. But as uh, Stuart has said, we want to build on the best plan of the attack, and that refers to what I call the three T's of good control. Um, and this is just a little way of reminding me that there are three major things to be looking at in terms of attacking the disease, which is attacking us. The first thing is to get our management actions or our disease control with the spraying with the right timing. If we don't get the right timing, we're done in. Equally, of course, if we don't have the right treatment, then we can equally be done in uh, because uh, any one of these weaknesses in any of these three links in a chain, as it were, can lead to a failure of the spray control. The third T is the uh, right technique. So the right timing, treatment and technique, all of these have got to be correct or we won't have good control. And today uh, we want to focus, I think, on the best timing for disease control and on that basis, uh, we can maybe build for later discussions on the, the technique and treatment, but they'll come up, I guess, in discussions as well. So they're the three T's uh, of good disease control. All right. So I guess I guess the next thing really is um, probably our two two mildews are the are the biggest issues um, that we've got. Um, yeah. Let's go into the approaches on on those and see where we go to from there perhaps. Okay, let's, let's do that. Uh, the mildews, uh, they cause confusion because of their name really, uh, powdery mildew and downy mildew. Their similar names lead to potentially some confusion because likewise both mildews, downy and powdery, have uh, white, pro produce white spores which are the mildew of the mildews, uh, are the white spores that you see. But they have very different biologies. If that's good English, it's probably not. And they behave very differently. So similar names, but different behavior. Let's look at powdery mildew, for instance. Uh, if something's powdery, it's dry. Um, so powdery mildew, if we think of it as actually powdery dry mildew, as our colloquial name, let's suppose, then we think of something that produces some uh, its spores and functions mainly as a dry weather disease. Now there is a component of that where wet weather is relevant for the disease, but mostly powdery dry mildew is a dry weather disease uh, and doesn't require uh, wetness. However, it does pr uh, proceed in wet conditions and high humidities it loves, but it doesn't need free water to germinate and that is a critical uh, difference between that, that and other diseases. Powdery mildew forms yellow blotches uh, on the leaves and the, the uh, both sides of the leaves. Uh, the blotch is an irregular shaped circle. Uh, so it's a blotch is like a bit of paint thrown at a wall and you get a blotch of splat, a splat of uh, paint. Well, the yellow blotches are irregular shape for powdery mildew. And by saying these things, what we're talking about is to set up a difference between powdery mildew in our thinking and downy mildew. The last point here is great. The powdery mildew produces gray white spores on the upper and lower surfaces of the leaves. So it's another way of differentiating from uh, downy mildew. Uh, and we'll see in a minute the difference between those two in further ways. For argument's sake then, downy mildew. What runs downhill? Well, water runs downhill, or so does the car if you leave the handbrake off and out of gear. 
Uh, we don't, that's nothing to do with anything really. So downhill mildew, which is another way of referring to this disease, uh, is a way of referring to it as a wet weather disease. So in contrast to powdery, it requires conditions that are associated with wet weather. It needs free water to spread. And when it spreads, it produces yellow oil spots, which are a spot or a circular in shape. And they're uh, on the upper surface, particularly seen uh, as an oily uh, uh, blotch. It's big upon an oily spot as distinct from the yellow blotches of powdery mildew. In contrast, uh, the, there are white spores of downy mildew instead of the grey white. Uh, and the down of downy mildew is actually these spores. And that occurs on the downside of the oil spots of powdery uh, downy mildew. So there are a lot of downs about downy mildew, and you've probably heard me say the same sort of thing before. So there are contrasts between the two mildews. Uh, their names are similar, but they're very different diseases. Uh, and that perhaps just as an intro, Stuart, does that set the scene for you? Yeah, I think so. Um, I guess really the, the, the thing is to start to um, nail the, you know, how do we deal with them? So I know you've always beaten into me that, that um, powdery mildew is probably the simplest to control. So let's start there, go through the discussion with that and probably get questions as we start that, I would have thought. So a strategy for managing powdery mildew, that's what we're on about. And yes, Stuart, uh, in my view, uh, powdery mildew is a disease which in principle is very simple to control. In practice, it's a very difficult one to get to achieve that. But in principle, if we make the principles work and make them work well, the practice is we can control powdery mildew. And whilst I'm on my little hobby horse of, uh, of this point, um, there, there's, uh, it's interesting to think about, and some of you would have heard me say this before, when powdery mildew was first introduced into Australia. And we might ask, uh, and you'll probably see the point of this in a minute, I hope, but uh, the first white settlers came to Australia in what, 1788, was that right? Uh, and by 1790, grapevines had appeared uh, in the soils of South of Australia, uh, over in New South Wales. Uh, and for the next 90 years, there was no such thing as powdery mildew on grapes. Uh, the disease needed to be introduced from eastern New York, uh, eastern USA, like New York, and then through to Europe and then to Eng uh, England and England to Australia. Uh, and Australia, uh, Victoria and New South Wales seem to be the first to get it. Uh, here we go again, a bit like the COVID business. So we had a long period of time where there was no powdery mildew in Australia. Now, our thinking can be that, oh, well, we're stuck with it. Well, I would suggest we're not. And there are a lot of similarities, I think, between COVID, the virus, and powdery mildew. And one of them is, I don't think we're stuck with it. If we're careful, if we uh, take out the right uh, management practices, which we've already discussed some of us while we're waiting to get going, COVID can be beaten. And we'll see that if we work hard enough at it. And the same situation applies. We can get rid of powdery mildew out of your vineyard, don't know about your neighbour, but out of yours. But if you've got another neighbour who is willing, we can get little areas or zones of freedom from powdery mildew because it is relatively simple in principle to apply that to practice if we're careful about the three T's. Peter, I've, yep. got, I've got my first question. Thank you, Mark. Good. The question system Good. is working. Um, and what he wants um, is, is can powdery mildew start in cold, dry weather? A very good question. Thanks, Mark. Uh, it depends how cold cold is. Um, it's temperatures above uh, six, seven or eight degrees for powdery mildew. So it can be quite cool to cold. It grows best, however, in uh, 20 to 28 degrees, very similar to downy mildew, uh, but particularly 20 to 25 degrees. So yes, it can start in cold weather but it does better in warm weather. A bit like me. So, uh, Mark, I hope that's happy. Are you happy with that? But do follow up with another question if you, if you want and anybody else has said before. 
So let's understand if we can in the following little dissertation, and I again apologize in a sense for those of you who've heard it before. Uh, I'd like to try and go through these three issues, which are the principles of good control of uh, powdery mildew by good spray timing. That is, what is an epi season? What's inheritance and indeed legacy and inheritance got to do with things? And what on earth is lag phase spraying? Well, let's investigate. First, the disease cycle. The disease starts in infected buds. And the disease came into Australia in infected buds, not infected boats, but infected buds. So the infected buds produce a spore uh, infected shoot which you see an image of here, like curled uh, leaves, stunted shoots with spores on it. The disease is spreading as soon as these buds come out and they come out usually about a fortnight after most of the other buds that burst in the vineyard. So they're a little late in coming out, but they're spreading spores immediately, like the COVID virus, a lot of similarities. So these flag shoots produce spores and these spores flake off a new one every day and are highly contagious like the virus uh, and they disperse the disease via things called canidia spores which are uh, these tiny spores you can't see on its own without a microscope or a hand lens and in dispersing the disease unseen as it were again like the virus the spores will land on the leaf at the upper or lower surface and infect the surface unseen by you. Now that infection site is a critical site because if you can have sprayed before the disease arrives, the spores arrive at that point of the leaf, you will provide a shield uh, and it's like wearing a face mask, I guess, uh, that you can stop the virus getting into you. And if you can stop the spore getting into you by spraying before the spore arrives, then you're going to do well and you're going to stop the powdery mildew there. Now, most people won't achieve that successfully um, because spray uh, treatment or the spray coverage, for argument's sake, may not be as good as it could be or should be, uh, so the infection can continue. The spore takes a little while to germinate on a leaf, to grow into a leaf before it's producing new spores. That incubation period is the time between the infection and the spots occurring. And there's an image there of little white blotches on the surface of a leaf and underneath that as the spores suck the juice out of the leaf, so you get these blotches on the leaf surface. So these new spots within four to five days are producing new spores. And these new spores are doing, uh, in, come in the millions and they're doing damage to nearby buds and infecting those which will be then quiescent or quiet until next year, next season. So you can get millions of spores dispersed in the wind. Again, like the COVID virus, you can get hundreds of people infected if you let it go for long. Many people will be infected before you really know what's going on at all. It's a very similar story and a very similar management practice as you'll see in a minute. So you get a cycling of these spores over a four to five day period. COVID takes 14 days, 10 to 14 days, so powdery mildew beats COVID in its ability to spread. There's another form of disease, uh, things called chasmothesia. They're a fruiting body, a bit like uh, an apple on an apple tree. Uh, it's got seeds inside it. They are produced late in the growth of a season. An apple doesn't uh, mature until uh, you know, January, February, March, April, May, depending on what varieties you've got. So these uh, chasmothesia form late in the season, January, February, March, April, uh, if you do not control these first lot of spores we've spoken of. So the chasmothesia, uh, they spread another spore from inside it, like the seed from inside the apple, there are seeds there inside the chasmothesia. And these ascospores fire off, they're like a heavyweight missile that is forcibly shot out of a chasmothesia, maybe on the bark. And they spread the ascospores to the underside of some leaves nearby, if there are any. 
uh, and those uh, also then go through, uh, cause infection, go through the incubation period and produce more spots like we just saw. So some of those spots come back and form new uh, chasmothesia if we let the disease be serious enough, enough in this coming season, uh, late in the season, they will form and carry the disease over into the next year. So just as there are two sources of infected uh, infection for powdery mildew, infected buds for us this year and chasmothesia from this year, both of those have come from last year and if we don't do anything about the disease, we'll have infected buds for next year and chasmothesia for next year. I wonder, Stuart, at this point, should I pause and wondered if there are any questions at this point about the source of the disease, please? Certainly we can, and I think it's not Vince, it's going to be Larry, isn't it? Um, so can can a healthy vine fight off these inve infections? So if it's a good, happy growing vine, does that make any difference to that infection process? Yes, it does in a contrary way, because a healthy growing vine usually has lots of soft young leaves. Uh, they are very susceptible and more susceptible to the aged leaves, the older leaves. Secondly, a mature, a growing, rapidly growing vine canopy is dense, shaded, free from ultraviolet light and creates a humidity in there that the powdery mildew likes. So in the old days when we used to grow vines with, uh, in the old German way with, um, without rootstocks, um, about knee to high, thigh height, lots of sun, uh, ultraviolet light from the sun in on the leaves, there was not much powdery mildew around. When we started to grow vines on rootstocks uh, and big canopies, uh, we had then a much greater task to control powdery mildew. Interrupt me if there are any questions. That's all we've got at the minute. Good. So the infected buds is where the main issue is uh, and we want to press on from there. Now in Australian vineyards, we've already said that they were disease free for about 70 year, rather I think I said 90, or that's not right, 70 year period without um, the disease. But now many growers spray six to eight times per season and some 12 to 14 times to control powdery mildew. But there's a very interesting thing we found when we've done our surveys around the place some people spray only four times a season and get very good control. So the issue is, as we'll press on from here, let's look at the details of how we're going to tackle this disease, reduce our number of sprays per season, and if possible, get rid of the disease. Like uh, one guy at Loxton from some years ago, he had a relatively isolated uh, vineyard free from other neighbours, although the neighbours are not usually the source of the disease, he got rid of the disease out of his own vineyard and for nine years did not spray powdery mildew. An incredible situation, it just proves the point. So we can have good control with few sprays if we do it well. Let's see how we can do that. Now we've talked about this, the three T's, and I had thought I had put these this slide behind. But the timing we need to deal with, there are an excellent array of fungicides that help us spray and control powdery mildew as long as we get our spray technology right as well, as said. Now, we're not stuck with powdery mildew. Uh, we can spray many times, but we need to make sure that we do the best thing to control the disease early season. And I'm going to jump through some of this because I had thought I'd turn this off. We're going to keep it simple as much as we can. We want to rethink our strategy where our strategies have been loose. Uh, and we want to clean up our inoculum reservoirs. And we can do that by reducing the number of infected buds for next year. And we can do that and if we do that successfully, we will, we will reduce our spray frequency required next year as well. Lag season spraying, let's investigate what this is. Now, some of you would have probably seen on the TV news uh, about the COVID virus, you'd have seen curves like this. 
It's called an exponential curve. Uh, and some of you will have heard of some of my complex mathematics, which I introduced to create these curves. Uh, and that reflects how powdery mildew grows and the virus spreads at the same sort of, sort of rate. Let's explain. Suppose we start off the year with two uh, spores that have come off an infected uh, shoot, the flag shoot at the beginning of the season. In other words, around about now. Let's suppose two spores are produced today and they each multiply to produce another spore tomorrow. The complex mathematics are that there will be four spores the next day. Now the complexity is, as you just listened to me say the numbers, this, the rate of the, which the disease increases is constant in that there will only ever be a multiplication of two. The speed with which the disease goes we will not increase, but watch what happens to the actual numbers out there. If we've got four spores on day two, we'll have eight spores on day uh, three, and then 16 spores, 32, listen to the numbers, 64, 128, 256, 500. Each day we're getting the same number, but the multiplication is increasing in the total number of spores there. And so the disease incidence increases. Just like the COVID virus, if we get in there and hammer it and hammer it hard and hammer it solidly, we can stop the disease increasing and we can uh, prevent what's gone on elsewhere. And in like South Australia, because we've had smaller numbers of people and so forth, we've been able to control the disease and effectively eliminate it from uh, the basic population. And we can do the same for powdery mildew. So the rate of disease increase is constant, but the number of disease there, number of spores is increasing dramatically if we let the disease get away from us. So that's a very critical thing about powdery mildew control. So leaf infection begins the moment there's some spores around. And so we get a disease incidence increasing like this. But by day 40 is when the numbers kick off, say 250 to 500, 500 to 1,000, 1,000 to 2,000, 2,000 to 4,000. The rate's the same. The numbers are now increasing at huge rate, huge number of spores. And this occurs around day 40 from bud burst. Now, bud burst, if we say for Chardonnay, uh, Stuart, am I right, going to be around about the 1st of September, something of that order, plus or minus, it's round figure, help me to do my simple mathematics because I can't cope with bigger mathematics. Um, so 30 days takes us to the 1st of October, 36 takes us to today. So we're looking for 40 days from bud burst, hello, and this is when the disease kicks off if we've done nothing. And so the critical point coming right up for us now, and when the disease gets up in numbers, it spreads and its numbers spread. And so the severity of the disease increases from day 40. In other words, plus or minus about now for Chardonnay. For later varieties, uh, and I guess a lot of your table grape varieties, are going to be very similar, and I guess I should have alluded to a table grape variety rather than a wine grape variety. Uh, but they're going to be pretty similar, aren't they, for, uh, as to Chardonnay, Stuart? Oh, well, we've got a range. So, you know, we've got um, early ripening in terms of, oh, sorry, yeah, they'll probably come out a little bit earlier, I guess, with, you know, things like Salma Peat all the way through to Sun Musket. Um, so, yeah, maybe one of you guys can tell me whether those, um, Bud burst dates are much different on those different varieties. Yes, well, I, I wait that call if somebody wants to make mention of that. Um, so the point that I'm wanting to make here is that now is a critical time. And particularly with your table grates, because you're going to have an earlier array, I would think. And so day 40 onwards is a critical time where the disease severity is starting to increase. And once the severity starts to increase, it's very difficult to catch it back. So let's press on. So leaf infection begins, but by day 80, the severity kicks off, and we really got to get our controls on before day 80. 
uh, if at all possible, because that's where fruit infection begins. When the severity increases sufficient, when there are enough spores to start hitting the young flowers, the uh, young berries as they form. So that's, we want to stop fruit infection. So if we reduce leaf infection, we're, we're uh, I'm going to go back there, sorry. So uh, if we are to reduce leaf infection, we want to ex extend the area of leaf, uh, a big part of lag phase. This is the lag phase where it's slowly increasing, though the rate's the same, and we want to stop this kickoff in disease here. Uh, and if we do that, we're going to achieve good success by spraying in this position. Can you see the cursor, by the way? Yep, good. So by spraying in here, we can get control of the disease before the log phase of rapid increase occurs. If we do that, we're going to stop and the lag log phase of the disease severity. So by lag phase spraying, that is in this time period here, we're going to do great things for us to stop the leaf and fruit infection that would follow if we left it uncontrolled. So uh, that will prevent the increase in disease severity, as we've said, and this will protect the crop for this season. And indeed, it will reduce the uh, increase in disease severity, which will reduce the amount of disease carryover for next season. So uh, we can, I, I believe we can reduce our inoculum reservoirs. We don't have to put up with the disease. So the season of an epidemic is an epi season, is a, a word I've coined. Uh, and it's a concept that's true for most foliage diseases, but the, what we're talking about here is legacy and inheritance. And these are the things we mentioned up front. What is an epi season and what, what is this business about inheritance? Now, legacy is something I leave behind. What we don't control this year is going to leave behind disease buds that will infect next year, as we've already said, and fruiting bodies will cause disease for next year. The legacy is what I leave behind. The inheritance is what I get next year. And we want to control the disease by taking note of this principle. Let's suppose we've got a season that's this season now. We've got bud burst, flowering, uh, we've got verizon, we've got uh, harvest and the leaf fall. This is season one. Let's suppose we've got two seasons in a row for this year and next year. We've already said we're going to have infected buds from last year. Uh, and flag shoots in Canada, we've talked about these, well, produce spores. And if we have Cleistothesia, these overwintering bodies, they'll produce these other spores. And so you'll get the disease to spread. And we had a curve we've seen a bit like this. We'll get new buds infected and new uh, fruiting bodies to carry over the disease if we don't do anything properly this year. However, if we take away the, the uh, well, sorry, no, let me say this way. Uh, this is a legacy we'll leave for next year. And so if we don't control the buds early this year, we'll have the buds next year. As said, we'll have likewise the fruiting bodies. And so we have an inheritance next year. Now, what we've then now got is a, a two season season of disease, a two growing season season of disease. And this is what I call an epi season. So the principle here, Stuart, is if we have uh, a capacity to do nothing, if we do nothing by spraying ineffectively or whatever, we will have the disease spread over the two seasons and we'll go on having to spray, having to spray, having to spray. Now the contrary is as indicated, if we can control the disease in the lag phase before the disease gets ahead of us, we're going to quell the disease and we're going to reduce the amount of inoculum and we're going to set ourselves up better for next year. And if we can keep doing that, we'll do ourselves a wonderful favour, both with the, the, the COVID virus issue and also with powdery mildew. Back to you, I think, Stuart. Peter, so the, the bottom line out of that was um, that early spray regime, uh, two, four and six weeks after bud burst? Yes, that's the summary of which I did not give. Correct, exactly. All right, so the bottom line is, yep. Uh, okay, another question from Mark. Um, Peter, I've gone back to using dusting sulphur, which was widely used years ago. Uh, I try to mix it up 
a bit. What's what's your view on using dusting sulfur? Well, dusting sulfur has got a lot of advantages. It's got some disadvantages. The the disadvantage is that it uh, uh, washes off very readily. Um, the the application of it as well, um, if you've got the machinery to do so, that's good. The um, uh, the problem with dusting sulfur in that washing off is that it leaves uh, gives you less control duration. The problem with its alternative, that's wetting sulfur, wettable sulfur, is that it can leave can, uh, residues that are not going to be helpful for dried fruit, uh, depending on what uh, whether it's table grapes. But generally speaking, uh, I would use a form of sulfur that's fitted with your program and what you want to do. Both are going to work. Wettable sulfur is good. Dusting sulfur is good. They've both got a fumigant action, and that's helpful, particularly if we get caught a bit behind and getting out into the canopy. I would suggest use the one you like to use best. Okay, very good. All right. Um, all right, I think, unless there's any other questions, we might um, move through um, downy mildew. Uh, okay, primary so. infection. The first infection, let's do it again. Uh, it starts in the soil in these form of the oospores, spores, which are resistant structures, which if the conditions are suitable uh, for disease, produce another spore from inside that one. They're called macrosporangia. We don't have to worry about the names particularly. Uh, and those spores produce another spore inside them. It's like one of those Russian dolls. You open one, you've got another one. You open another one, you've got another. And here we've got zoospores that are produced if the conditions are warm enough, wet enough for long enough in the soil. And then if that holds true, the zoospores when formed in the uh, soil will be splashed to infect green tissue and that will cause oil spots. For the disease to continue in what we call infection, we start with oil spots on green tissue. The oil spots then produce a very similar process as you'll see not macrosporangia, but sporangia. And these sporangia themselves contain the small Russian doll called zoospores, as we said. And then you'll get, if the conditions are right, infection of further green tissue, and you'll get a new generation of oil spots. Let's look at that and see what it means in a bit more detail. And if I confuse you, I hope there's some clarity to come when we get to the website. So let's look at the conditions required for downy mildew primary infection. There's once a song written by a bunch of clowns, two of them, uh, I have to own up to being one of them, uh, about 10, 1024. It was a, um, uh, a song uh, to tell us about the disease. There's a lot more detail than the rap song told. This is the detail now, not just 10, 1024, which is 10 degrees and in uh, t with 10 millimeters of rainfall in a 24 hour period that's a rule of thumb but let's look more particularly what we need for downy mildew to start we need rainfall or irrigation to wet the soil and if it's dry we need three to five millimeters and if it's wet and it maybe just two to three mil millimeters of wa water or of precipitation to wet the soil sufficiently for the disease process we just looked at to start that is for the oospores to begin to germinate. If the soil is warm enough, wet enough for long enough, that is for about 16 hours of soil wetness, these oospores produce the macrosporangia, as I've said, and then the zoospores around about the 16th hour. It depends on the temperature and a lot of factors. This is simplifying it all. These zoospores swim in water and they need to be brought now up into the vine canopy if they've been produced in the soil. Suppose we're looking at the underside of a leaf, uh, where's my cursor here, uh, and if the rain comes down and the spores are splashed up, then we can get infection. Do you remember the little graph we had for powdery mildew? If we can get spray on here at that surface, the lower side of the leaf, for downy mildew, both sides of the leaf for powdery, then we can control these spores before they even invade the leaf. So that's protective care. And if you can get the timing of that right, it stops infection. But if you do nothing, that's what's going to happen. The infection will occur then 
uh, and will pe- the, the zoospores will penetrate inside the leaf if we have 45 degree hours of leaf wetness. What's a degree hour, you might ask? Well, let's suppose the temperature is 20 degrees for one hour. That's 20 degree hours. Suppose it can endure for two hours. That's 40 degree hours, and that's nearly enough for the uh, leaf wetness for the spores to germinate. And so you can get the germination if the conditions are right for long enough. And so you'll get, have what we call secondary infe- uh, primary infection will have occurred at that point. Now, after that, you get a period then uh, after primary infection where the disease uh, will have occurred in the vineyard. And suppose we've had the conditions right for uh, primary infection. Uh, You've had the rainfall, we've had the spores come up, we've got an infection site. And this is the time to get in to control the downy mildew after the event. If we know that the infection has actually occurred, we can't see it yet. But this is in the incubation period, the time of silence between the infection occurring and the symptoms showing. If we can spray there in this infection site, effectively we can knock out the oil spot which will will occur otherwise and we'll press on to say there secondary infection can then occur as we've just seen the infection process is very similar but starting from an oil spot this time instead of an oil spore and secondary infection occurs if we have high humidity higher temperature that's 13 degrees in four hours of darkness you'll get the down of downy mildew on the underside of those oil spots from primary infection. And if that's the case, then infection will occur again the same 45 degree hours. It's usually two or three hours wetness of leaves before dawn. So what we want to do is stop secondary infection by stopping the primary infection and quelling the disease at this point if we can so that we don't get lots more infections from spores spreading from that single oil spot. Because if we don't, those infection sites will become uh, oil spot sites after the incubation period. And if you've got 20 to 50 oil spots from primary infection, you can end up with 100,000 secondary infection sites with the oil spots showing uh, after the incubation period. So, um, Downy can't spread until the oil spots actually appear. And as I said, this is the time between infection and the appearance of oil spots. If uh, protective sprays have not been applied, that's the last shot that we get out of doing so. So if you've got oil spots on your leaves, warm, wet nights can spread disease. And that's the risk, uh, particularly this night, uh, this season, Uh, and we want to really be quite vigilant about these things uh, given the forecast wet conditions ahead of us. Stuart. You're muted perhaps. I am, thank you for that. Um, That's a really good concise um, run through on downy mildew. Thank you for that, Peter. Any questions on downy because if not, we'll take you in and show you um, the Grow Care website and how that um, how that provides us with an early warning, particularly for that primary infection, and then it'll also cover off on potential secondary infections. It's it's just about knowing, I guess, for everybody um, when those conditions have occurred. This um, this information on the website here um, is coming from the weather stations around our region. This um, regional network you'll see up here is actually the wine grape network. We do have our DFA sites on here, um, but we're going to use this particular station at Cardross um, because it gives us a good example. Um, So the last predicted rain event, the big one that we were waiting for that didn't really turn out that way was on the 19th of November. So Friday, Saturday and Sunday, Peter and I were on the phone watching this model unveil itself to see whether we needed to be out very quickly with us something to say there was a um, likelihood of a, um, whether the model was telling us there was a high likelihood of a primary infection or not. As it turned out, it turned, suggested there was a very low 
uh, exceedingly low likelihood of a primary infection. It was only at this site that that was uh, the case. So we did put something out, but it wasn't um, it wasn't quite as urgent as what we thought. So Stuart, we will just be... a quick comment, yep. Stuart. Please, can the screen come a little bigger at all? Uh, that could please. be a bit tricky for me. Um, if you hold control down and roll your your uh, mouse, it can up and down. Only in those lumps, Peter. Right, gotcha. Not to worry. I hope others can see it. Yeah, because it will get a little bit a little bit um interesting. So you can see that this graph has got from the 19th of September. You can see my um thing down here. Um right the way through to the 22nd. So we've got this set on a three day um graph setting. So Peter, what do you think, what are the key elements we need to talk about in here? Yeah, I think there are a number of things. Uh, first of all, the red line is a trace of the temperature uh, recorded every minute in the vineyard. The data are stored uh, for every 10 minute period, averaged and presented. So this is the very, very detailed uh, weather temperature record. The black line is humidity, similarly stored and assessed. And you can see it goes up to 100% when it gets a flat line at the top. Uh, and the blue uh, histograms, the blue blocks there are rainfall. And the green is how, uh, the, how long the leaves have been wet. So it's wetness of leaves. Remember we said we need leaves wet to cause infection. The gray, where Stuart's cursor is now is darkness and the white is daylight. Downy mildew, as we've said, to spread at night needs darkness. So we need to know each of these factors in controlling uh, and getting a grip of when the infections are occurring. Just to make it clear for everybody, the lines are there, but as I move the cursor along the lines, you see you get the exact numbers appearing up in the graph. So as I move along, the temperature changes, the humidity changes, you see the actual rainfall. So it's just it appears up in the um in the in the table above the graph. Stuart, do you want to show the yellow curtain briefly? So if you were to click once and then click again on the blue ball at the top, you get a yellow curtain. And that allows you to see for how long the leaves have been wet in that condition, uh, how much rain. So yes, if Stuart goes to the left hand side of when leaves started to be wet, then Stuart, if you go back and modify the right hand side, we've now got the wetness condition that was there in that vineyard uh, in that summary period. And Stuart, could you read out, would you mind reading out please the conditions in that period just to let us know in relation to 10, 10, 24 and the detail we've been through as to what uh, didn't, didn't occur there. So over that period, we had 6.3 mils of rain. Um, we had leaf wetness for 21.7 hours, and that, oh, 96%. So there must've been a gap where they dried out. They did, there was all the little gaps where they dried out. Uh, are they the two key ones for that? Yes, the minimum temperature there for primary infection, we can accept down to eight degrees and it showed the minimum was 12 and the humidity was high. So what we had were the basic ingredients, except we don't know with from this graph how wet the soil was for the oospores, spores. Um, and we don't know for exactly how long and what progression there were for the zoospores spores to develop. Uh, if you remember, we talked about these swimming spores and they need to be splashed. So did the rain fall at the right time for the, after the zoospores spores were formed? Did they form? Uh, we need to know more details. So as a pathologist, I look at the graph here and I go, hmm, uh, but did anything to spread from this condition or not? I'm wanting to know the answer. So is that, uh, we now tell everybody to hold on to their pants because we're going to turn the rest of the graph on? Yes, I think we should take it very carefully. But there's some complexity about to appear. Yeah, this gets really complex, but it is it is really good. So graph options. What do I need, Peter? Okay. Some spores. So what we've got is we can turn on the infections model T1, first of all. Done. That'll give us a cue 
from the computer system as to whether all of the conditions we've talked about for downy mildew primary infection occurred or not. If we turn on soil wetness, please, that's an indicator of the very top soil where the oospores are and where they can germinate. So it's not for irrigation of uh, how much water is needed for the vines, but it's in relation to disease. The next one down is whether the zoospores, these swimming spores have been produced or whether they're surviving. So we click both of those. Uh, are there oil spots coming? Well, that we can click, but um, we need to have infection for that to occur. So you can click both of those, it won't make any difference. Uh, with degree hours of wetness, we want to know, uh, did the zoospores get spread by rain? Remember they needed to splash. And does the model itself um, have any further great predictions we can have a look at or infections there? So we tick all of those and now hold on. Now, do you want me to go through those, uh, Stuart? Yeah. Or do you uh, want to do that? See, no, no, you go through that because I will make a mess of it. I'll guarantee you. <laughs> Let me just see. Can I? Yes. Is that a bit better for everybody? That's good for me. Okay. I guess we should ask the question, can anybody not see uh, the date and time at the bottom of the page? Sounds like we're good. Good. So we might click uh, or look at the yellow clicked area, the yellow curtain, and that's the zone we're focusing in on. So the disease to start, if we remember we needed soil wetness of sufficient duration and quantity, that blue line that's horizontal just to where the right hand indicator is. The blue lines increase where the cursor is now going and it's horizontal across. So the, the soil has been wet and that's good. And then you can see where it dries out and the blue line deteriorates down low as you progress on in time. The humidity's dropped, the temperature's risen, the soil is drying out. And so uh, that we're interested is where the yellow curtain is. Actually, Stuart, if you wouldn't mind adjusting, please, from the left-hand side, is to where the blue line starts so at the beginning of rainfall. So in that zone there is where the conditions are shown for us that are relevant for primary infection of downy. The conditions need to be above eight degrees. The temperatures we've already indicated was above 12. The leaves are wet. Now what we want to see is the production of zoospores and don't be run, uh, running away and hide too quickly because all these lines that come into some uh, there's a horizontal, big pun, an angled line uh, climbing up the hill, it's being indicated there, which says that the zoospores are being produced. At the point where the steward is now with the cursor, they now have, according to the models, been predicted for this vineyard site at Cardross, and so infection can occur if we then got rain splash of sufficient duration uh, to spread the zoospores. Stuart, if you wouldn't mind pointing out the little uh, peak down the bottom uh, where the zoospore production right there, just fractionally below there, shows there's been a tiny bit of rain, about 0.1 millimetre of rain. You might not have seen that even, but the model picked it up uh, and says there was a little bit of rain that could have splashed the zoospores to the leaves. Then, then the question is, were the leaves wet enough, warm enough for long enough for those zoospores to have spread uh, and infected into a leaf. And the, there's a graph line that goes up, it's green, it goes up across the page. And that indicates that after 45 degree hours, you'll see in red there at the top, DMP, it, the model predicts there's a downy mildew primary infection. Uh, with all of these factors coalescing, and I, I forgive me if it has been too complicated, but there is a lot of technology going on in the background in which a single vertical line says DMP. Now this system will have uh, alerted you in your pocket if you were to have registered for Downey. Uh, it will ring up your, or your phone or give you a quick text message to say that there's been a Downey mildew primary infection occurred in the, in the weather station nearest you or the one that you've selected to have a look at. 
So you don't need to go into all of this information. And today's exercise was to show you the detail of what is required for the disease biologically, to show you the website giving you a summary of all of these conditions, culminating in a vertical line on this graph, if the disease has occurred as it is predicted here for Cardros, or not if it hasn't. And this can be reduced to a simple alert text message in your pocket without you having to know any of what we've looked at or, or even thought about. Uh, so that we want to today give you some background to what's going on with these alert conditions that uh, we're working with. Stuart? All right, so um, from the terms of what we're doing with DFA, it relies on me ringing Peter and Peter ringing me when these uh, conditions like this start to show up um, and us tracking this and getting um, some information out to everybody to say, look, this has occurred. Um, if you want to get this more immediately, um, talk to Peter about getting logged into the website and, and getting that text um, to your phone. But it's just to let you know, this is all the detail that's happening in the background. This is how the model's working away. Uh, and the fact that we have it sitting at this regional network. So we've got the wine grape guys. So we have got a whole range of these websites, uh, sorry, weather stations around the place um, with the wine grape guys and they've kindly given us access to those. Uh, we've got our own three that we've got at the minute, admitting this one's going to move to Lipparoo. Um, so we've got the same sort of detail coming out of these for the DFA um, website. So look, I think it was just to describe that it's all that information um, is sitting in there. Um, Peter, there is another function on here, um, the purple B. Did you want to quickly, um, oh, John, what type of irrigation? Irrigation. I don't know what type of irrigation was on that site. Uh, and I guess, yes, what you're saying is if they, if it was a sprinkler irrigation um, and you created enough splash out of sprinkler irrigation after those um, spores have been released from the ground, can you splash that up to create a primary infection? Peter, is that a fair enough question? Yes, it's a very good question. Uh, if for argument's sake that uh, the uh, was a drip irrigation, you'd have wet areas of the soil. You'd have a small chance of that wetness coinciding then with rainfall uh, and then causing the conditions of wetness to be long enough if that occurred prior to the rain. Uh, if it was uh, overhead sprinklers or something like that, then the foliage and the ground would be wet uh, right across. I don't suppose there are too many of those around. So the type of irrigation has an, an influence on the risk disease, depending on how much soil was wetted in these marginal conditions when the rainfall didn't deliver at the other weather stations, only at this one. Yeah. So it's a good question. Yeah, so you could have had, you could have created the splash required to, with a, an undervine sprinkler? No, because you're not going to wet the foliage enough. You've got, uh -huh. to, you've got to get the wetness to the foliage. So really it's the rainfall before, a big part the weather prior to the rain. So the rain does the splashing if the zoospores have, are readied at that point of rainfall. All right, so it's more about the soil wetness that you can influence. Yes. John, does that, um, that answer where you're going with that one? I presume so. Um, sorry, yeah, okay, so this one here, Peter, the the, the purple B, how, what, what's that telling? Yes, the B is for bunch rot. Uh, what we've got then for bunch rot conditions, without going to all the detail, if we think of briefly the conditions for downy mildew secondary infection, that is high humidity, uh, temperatures above 13 degrees, uh, and for downy it requires that at dark, um, the darkness requirement is not required for bunch rots, in this case B for botrytis, <coughs> but they're very similar. So these conditions are very similar to the downy mildew secondary infection, and we've got a model in there now, which is on more experimental basis, but it's showing us the conditions were suitable 
for a uh, bunch rot infection uh, at the date and time indicated, which I've got a, a toolbar comes across the bottom there, Stuart. Uh, 21st maybe, of September. Thank you. 21st of September, about, uh, is it 8 a.m.? 8 a.m. Yeah. So uh, bunch rot infection of at flowering is a critical issue. Bunch rot infection around harvest time is critical when the berries become sugared up. And so this gives us an alert to the conditions for bunch rots. And whilst the time of infection, uh, well, I should ask this question, uh, how close to flowering are you on your leading varieties, please? Can't be, it must be only a week or two, I would have thought. Has anybody else, anybody else been out and had a look more, in more detail than I have? Any estimates on flowering? Turn your microphone on and tell me. <laughs> I would have thought your two-week period was probably pretty good. At least, said Mark. I'd say yeah, two weeks. Yep, and you'll be earlier than um, everybody than everybody down in this end of the world. True. Oh, sorry, was that Vinny or Mark? Uh, sorry, Larry or Mark? It was Larry. Sorry, Larry. That's all right. <laughs> yeah, good oh, on Larry's Larry. right for here. Yeah, good on you. So what this shows, what the model has shown us in, the, in this, this little example, and there are the dates we can slide the graph to and fro and have a look at, but it shows that there have been a number of times where bunch rot infection could have occurred if, in fact, the grapes were at that point of maturity uh, ready to be infected. Now, they haven't been and won't be until flowering. But what it says to us is that the spore load can multiply on other crops uh, and other plants and on uh, dead tissue. So botrytis and the other bunch rot organisms can grow and will have grown in these conditions where it's said to be suitable. Won't have caused any damage to the grapevines, but when the grapevines become susceptible, it means this year because of the rains gone by, that we've going to have more spores around than otherwise in a dry year. Yeah, so here's, a, here's another suggest... example, Peter, on the 25th of September, bit of rain, you can see the soil wetness climb, um, conditions potentially for a bunch rot incident, but still with, before flowering. That's right. So the, this website will show you the conditions when they were suitable for bunch rot, bunch rot to grow, it's up for the user to interpret whether that was at a critical time on that patch you have specific interest in. So yes, you can see those, there are a number of those occasions. This year we're likely to have some more of those. The question is, is it at flowering or coming up to harvest? Because they are the two critical points. Having said that, if I might hasten to say, and I just probably get thrown out if I say this, um, the evidence in my view is not entirely clear to say that if uh, bunch rot infection occurs at flowering, that that will translate to any difference at harvest. Now, some people say, well, any risk is enough risk, so I don't want it, so I'll go and spray. And probably that's the safest way. However, just because the conditions are wet during the flowering period, doesn't, in my view, necessarily suggest that there's going to be more rots at harvest. If, for argument's sake, if it's, argument's sake, if it's dry, you might have a berry sugar up that got infected, but if it's dry weather, that won't infect the neighbours. You've got one or two berries there that are shriveled and died, no further damage. So just because you get a bunch rot infection signalled doesn't necess necessarily suggest there's an urgency to have sprayed or go and spray in relation to it. But it's a suggestion, take note and work out your strategy that you want to apply to control bunch rots.